Here's something amazing. Lexus, the brand that makes the SUV driven by my 65-year-old mother, has just come out with a $100,000 sports car to rival the Porsche 911 and the BMW 6 Series and the Jaguar F-Type and the Mercedes SL. It's this thing. It's the 2018 Lexus LC500, and yes, it costs over $100,000 for a Lexus sports car. Today, I'm going to find out if it's worth it. I've borrowed this LC500 from McDermott Lexus here in East Haven, Connecticut, where it is listed for sale for $101,054. $101,000 for a Lexus Coupe. I just can't get my mind around it. This is the same company that'll lease you a nice little RX with plush leather seats, and they'll even sell you a nice little blanket that you can keep in the back seat at all times, just to be cautious. But then this isn't just any Lexus Coupe. The LC500 uses a 5-liter V8 with 471 horsepower and 400 pound-feet of torque. 0 to 60 is about 4.6 seconds, and it has a 10-speed automatic transmission. There's also a hybrid model, but this isn't that. This is a naturally aspirated rear-wheel drive coupe that'll do 170 miles an hour. It sounds like I'm talking about some AMG Mercedes or some BMW with gold brake calipers, but this is a Lexus. So today I'm going to take you on a tour of the LC500. I'm going to show you all of its weird quirks and cool features, and then I'm going to get it out on the road and find out if Lexus has really built a luxury sports coupe worth $100,000. And then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And click the link below to go to autotrader.com slash oversteer for more of my thoughts on the LC500. Now, I'm going to start off on the inside of this car, and I'm going to show you all of the cool quirks and the weird features, but I also want you to pay attention to this car's incredible attention to detail. It's really impressive, better than just about anything I've reviewed. Starting with, for example, the door locks. Now, in your car, you have a door lock. It goes up, it's unlocked. It goes down, it's locked. In this car, when you press the lock button and you lock the door, a little green light comes on and illuminates a little lock logo to let you know that the door is locked. And the little weird quirks and touches only get more interesting from there. Next up, I'm going to talk about the inside side of the door, which isn't often a place I take you when I'm showing you the quirks and features, but in this case, it's kind of cool. You see those door rivets? Obviously, every car has them. Nobody ever looks at them. Fine. But in this car, they have the Lexus logo engraved on them in three separate places. That is something that nobody who buys this car will ever pay attention to or notice or look at, but it's still there. Now, when you get inside and look at the gauge cluster, you'll find that it is one of these configurable gauge clusters, just like every exotic car and luxury car has now. That's not all that surprising. The cool thing about this one is that the gauge cluster physically moves when you press the right button. It moves over depending on what screens you want to see. That's borrowed from the Lexus LFA supercar from a few years ago, and it makes it a lot more interesting than a regular everyday gauge cluster. Another neat thing about the gauge cluster in this car is that, like in a lot of cool modern sports cars and luxury cars, it changes based on what driving mode you're in. Take a look at this. When you have it in comfort mode, it looks normal. Put it in sport and the tachometer and the red line become more visible. Put it in sport plus and they become even more visible so that you can feel like you're extra sporty in that moment. Now, moving on from the gauge cluster, check out the buttons for the stereo control, specifically the Seek Track button. In your car, it's just a little button you press, and it's plastic, and it's ugly. In this car, it's this beautiful aluminum thing that you switch up and down. It's the same story with the radio tune button. I almost want to go around changing the radio station all the time just so I can play with this cool aluminum tune button. But those aren't even the best radio controls. I wish you could feel the power and volume control in this car. It is so heavy and so smooth. I can't even really explain how luxurious it feels just to turn on the radio in this thing and turn up the volume. On the passenger side, even the button to open the glove box feels nice. There's no flimsy little plastic handle here, and the whole thing feels like it's about to break off. Instead, to access the glove box, which, by the way, is something you'll rarely ever do, you push this heavy aluminum button, and it just pops right open. It feels really luxurious. I also like the look of the door panel. Instead of sporty, they went for quality and style. I like these little Alcantara ridges, and above that is a door handle set apart from the rest of the door panel that's surprisingly sturdy and high quality. Also really upscale feeling are the climate control buttons in this car. Just look at them. They're absolutely gorgeous, of course, but when you press them, they just give the right amount of feedback, and they just feel so nice. I want to go around adjusting the climate control constantly. I can't stress enough. Every button in this car just feels perfect, really well screwed in there, and they don't shake. They don't rattle. They're not loose. And since we're talking about climate controls, this car has one of the strangest assortments 
amounts of climate control vents I've ever seen in any car I've reviewed. Take a look at this. The driver has one climate control vent. The middle of the car has one climate control vent. And the passenger has three climate control vents, two of which appear to point directly up at the ceiling. I have no idea why Lexus decided to do it this way, but I promise if you ever ride in this car as a passenger, you will be bathed in the comfort of Lexus climate control. Next up, let's talk dome lights. Now this car has dome lights, just like every other car, but you'll notice there's no switch to turn them on or off. So how do you do it? You just tap it and it's on. Tap it and it's off. Tap it and it's on. I could do this all day. In fact, if I was riding in this car, I think I would do it all day. Now, I've talked a lot about the quality of materials in this car, but two things especially stand out to me from everything else in this car. Number one, the grab handles. That's what you as the passenger get to grab onto if the driver's doing something crazy. Now, a lot of cars have grab handles, that's no surprise. And in this car, they're really sturdy. You grab them, you can pull them as hard as you want, and they don't even bend a little bit. That's also no surprise, a lot of cars have that. But this car has the grab handles finished in leather with aluminum inserts for your hands so you don't get the leather dirty. Another cool thing is Lexus's remote touch interface face, which is their name for their infotainment system. Now, it's controlled with a little trackpad down here. You move your finger around and control what's on the screen. We'll get to that more in a minute. The cool attention to detail bit is right back here. It's this little raised hump for you to rest your hand on while you're moving the trackpad around. Now, if you look closely at this hump, you'll notice something. The rest of the center console is this stitched leather, a nice material, but this thing is a completely different material. It's more durable. It's designed to last longer because Lexus knows you'll constantly be putting your hand on it in order to use the remote touch controller. That is cool attention to detail. Something else I love about the interior of this car, this car weighs 4,300 pounds. It is not fooling anyone into believing that it's some sort of ultra lightweight sports car that can be thrown around the curves like a Miata. And as a result, there is no carbon fiber anywhere in the interior of this car. There's no attempt to save weight or to look like they're saving weight or, oh, look, we made the dashboard carbon fiber. So actually we've lost five pounds. Aren't we cool? There's none of that. Instead, they haven't surrendered to this trend of carbon fiber just for the sake of looks. Of course, like in any car, I did notice a few drawbacks in the LC's interior. For one, the front cup holder is absolutely tiny. It can't hold anything. And if you do stick something in there, it blocks the climate controls. Probably not something that should happen in a car that's designed to be more luxury than sport. There is also a rear cup holder but accessing it is bizarre and it involves using the strangest center console I've seen in a long time. You open the center console and there's your cup holder, not shaped like a cup. And then once the center console has been released to cup holder form, you can open it and use it as an actual center console, although it's only hinged to turn towards the driver. If you attempt to open the center console when it's in its forward position, it doesn't work. It's actually locked shut. You have to push it back and then open it. So it's a two-step process to open the center console and then the passenger can't access it anyway. Another thing, this car is all about technology and new styling and cool features, and yet Lexus has placed this stupid analog clock right next to this giant new screen that they're using. I don't understand why they're still doing the analog clock thing. I'm just put a digital clock in there. It doesn't fit with the rest of the interior. And then can we discuss the movies that you're shown upon startup? This has become a bigger and bigger trend in the car industry. I'm not sure why, and this car plays two movies. Here's the one in the gauge cluster. And here's the one in the center screen. Now, I don't have anything against these movies per se, but why is this happening? I don't really need to see a movie when I start my car. Now, before I move on to the exterior quirks and features, we have to talk about remote touch interface, which is Lexus's infotainment system. Like I mentioned, it's a little trackpad you move with your hands, and it has been widely criticized for being difficult to use, hard to understand, not intuitive, and I have agreed with every single one of those criticisms about previous versions of this system. However, the LC500 uses the newest remote touch interface system. It is debuting in this car and it's not out in any other car yet. And I have to say, finally, they've made it work. It's not really all that bad this time. I would still rather have a touch screen, but as automakers are getting bigger screens and trying to put them further away near your line of sight, touch screens are becoming a thing of the past in these cars. It's easy to scroll around and click on various menu items with your fingers. It's surprisingly intuitive. Pinch to zoom in the navigation system works tremendously well with no delay or lag like the old systems. There's no buttons you have to click separate from your trackpad. Instead, you just push down on the trackpad, which makes things a lot easier. 
In the end, no automaker has come up with a perfect solution to controlling the infotainment system, except for maybe Tesla, who has just transported a jumbotron inside each car. This solution is Lexus's best effort yet. It's by far better than any previous remote touch interface, and it isn't really that difficult to use or to master. I swear. Would Doug lie to you? Yeah, probably, but I'm not lying right now. Now, moving on to the back of the LC500, we get to talk about one of my favorite things about this car, and that would be the brake light turn signal combo in back. Now, let's just kind of cheat down on the top of the brake lights with this plastic strip here that doesn't really feel all that high quality, but they did not cheap out on the brake lights themselves. There are mirrors inside the taillight, and it just reflects the LED over and over and over again. I've never seen anything like this before in a car, and I think it's awesome. Now, the turn signal is also super cool. You can see that it lights up just like a regular turn signal, but it sort of has this vertical shape compared to the horizontal taillights. It looks a little like the Lexus LFA, and it looks really cool, like nothing else in the road. Now, since I'm talking about lighting, might as well come up front and talk about one of the cool details in the headlights. Now, this car has LED running lights. That's not that unusual. All cars have that now. But the cool thing about this one is the LED light extends from the sort of middle of the car next to the grille all the way into the actual lighting assembly where it ends. That is a really cool detail. I don't know how they got that to work and I don't know what it would cost to replace a lighting assembly in this car, but I suspect it isn't cheap. Next up, let's talk trunk. Now, obviously there are several ways to get into the trunk of this car. It's not like a Lotus where you have only one way and you better hope it doesn't break. There is a button inside the car. It opens up the trunk, obviously. And there's another one on the key fob that you press and that'll open up the trunk. But what if you're just walking up to the back of the car and you want to open up the trunk? There's no button back here. There's no latch. So how do you do it? Well, there is a hidden button hidden in the passenger side taillight assembly. It's a little circle. You push it and the trunk pops open. You'd never know to do that unless, of course, you watch this video. Next up, here's a look under the hood. Now this looks about how you'd expect although there's a little bit less plastic than you might expect. You might find in other Lexus models. The most interesting thing to me about what's under the hood are these little canisters. There are two in the front of the engine area and two by the hinges near the base of the windshield, and they have little explosion diagrams on them. That's because they explode. For pedestrian safety regulations, these little canisters explode if you hit a pedestrian, and they push the hood up in order to provide a little cushion for the pedestrian, so they aren't injured as severely. Next up, let's talk about getting in, and specifically getting into the back, which is particularly easy for someone my size. But before I do that, let's talk about the door handles, which are really cool. Now, when you walk up to the car, the door handles are flush with the door. In order to unlock the car, you push this end of the door handle, they pop open, and then they reveal the Lexus logo, which was hidden. Now it's waiting for you to come up and pull on it to open the door. When you want to lock the car, just push the end with the Lexus logo. The car locks and the handles retreat back into the door. Then it comes time to get inside. So then it's my turn to... Uh, uh, uh. Now, once I'm back here, you can see the front seat, even in the far forward position, <laughs> I can't get it to lock. So this isn't really the place to be if you're six foot three or six foot four. Now, one of the interesting things I found when I'm back here is that the seat belts come out of the middle, not out of the sides and the pillars like in every other car. Another interesting exterior detail, the sunroof is just a panel. It doesn't open to let air in, although you can open the sunshade inside the car to let light through the panel and into the interior. The other cool thing about the exterior of this car, that would be the exhaust note, which is very unlexus like So those are all the cool features and quirks of the LC500. Now it's time to get it out on the road and find out what it's like to drive a $100,000 Lexus luxury sports coupe. All right, here we go. The first thing you notice is it's just very quiet. The intent of this one is to be sort of more of a touring car. <clears throat> And you get the sense that you're driving a, a, a larger vehicle. The thing I noticed more than the speed is the sound. It sounds like a muscle car or an AMG or whatever. Like it really has that exhaust note. This is gonna be one of the last naturally aspirated V8s. Uh, this is it. This is the end of the line right here. Yeah, I love the little crackle on the upshift. It feels, it sounds great. So the, the thing you notice, now I'm on the highway and I'm cruising at a speed that I won't say, and uh, it's very quiet and it's very comfortable. And, and, and you already start to get the sense of what you're driving here. This is an all-around car. And even at this price point, some stuff is faster, but this car has this very nice interior and this very comfortable ride, etc. And that's kind of its big selling point over some of these cars that are maybe a little bit more frenetic if you're not interested in them. The seats are very comfortable. 
the visibility is good. There's no, you don't have to make compromises like that. So the Japanese, when they come out with cars like this, they never have any stupid compromises. The seat is very comfortable. It's perfect for my size. It just, oh, it's just the, right around my body. It just feels very nice. So this car has a thing where if you want the seats heated or cooled or whatever, you change the climate control, the air conditioning heating, and it automatically will adjust the heated and cooled seats to your desired temperature. You don't have to deal with any fussy heated or cooled seat buttons. Man, yeah, the noise is amazing. It's fast. It's not like blow your head off fast like a Ferrari or something, but it also only, it only costs $100,000. I mean, this isn't this is never going to be a 488. There's no, there's no creaking. There's no shaking. There's no. Everything feels as it should. Uh, everybody says, "Oh, German cars are the best built." Well, you know, this car is well constructed. And one of the other interesting things about this car is, I noticed that there's not a lot of shared parts and switches with other Toyota and Lexus cars. That yeah, tunnel coming up. It feels very stable. There's virtually no body roll. I'm surprised about that. The steering is obviously a little bit lighter than in a 911 or something like that. Uh, it feels more like a luxury car than like a true sports car, but it feels more like a true sports car than any Lexus I've ever driven. One thing about it, the transmission feels great. The transmission is not jerky and it's not slow to respond. It sound is so good. Whoo! <laughs> Honestly, it is a little firm, a firm for a Lexus. Yeah. But in terms of sports cars, it's the ride is excellent. <laughs> So that's the Lexus LC500. Now based on the styling, I initially thought this was more of a sports car, but after driving it, I've learned it's really more of a luxury touring car. And for that reason, I think Lexus is gonna have kind of an uphill battle selling these things because this segment isn't very popular. The Jaguar XK is canceled. The BMW 6 Series Coupe is canceled. Mercedes doesn't make a coupe version of the SL, and there seems to be at least one unsold S-Class Coupe at every single Mercedes-Benz dealer across the entire country. Country. Still, the LC is one of the coolest looking cars on sale today and it's wonderfully well built and luxurious. The real problem will come with the name. When people spend $100,000 for a coupe, they want Jaguar, Mercedes-Benz, Porsche, BMW, and not necessarily Lexus. So is it worth it? I think objectively this car is as good as or better than every single rival in its segment. And I think it's absolutely worth $100,000. Now, before you go and say, well, you could have a 911 or you could have a GTR. Keep in mind that the people who buy this car are people who have sampled those cars and they want something more luxurious, more relaxed, smoother, more comfortable. I'm just not really sure how many of those people actually exist. Anyway, on to the Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the LC500 is a gorgeous car. It really looks like a concept car for the road, and I think its looks are its biggest selling point. It easily earns an 8 out of 10. Acceleration is based on an objective scale, and 4.6 seconds 0 to 60 gives it a 6 out of 10. Handling is good with little body roll, but it's a big car and steering is light, so it earns a 6 out of 10. Next up is Cool Factor, and this is a cool car, especially right now with very few of these on the road, so it easily earns a 7 out of 10. Finally, importance measures how much you'd want to see a car in a museum or at a car show. It's certainly a standout special car, and it's especially important for Lexus, who's in the midst of trying to change their image, so it earns a 7 out of 10. That brings the total weekend score to 34 out of 50, placing it right in the middle, which is about right for a luxury touring car with sporty intentions. Next up are the daily categories, starting with features. This car has it all with radar cruise control and automatic steering and that trick climate control system. It earns a 9 out of 10, falling just short of a 10 because it doesn't deliver something wildly innovative like Tesla Autopilot. Comfort is good. It still has a somewhat sports car harsh ride, but it's better than most sports cars I've driven, earning it a 7 out of 10. Next up is quality, which measures both reliability and materials, and those are the LC500 strong suit. Reliability is of course untested, but I can give it the benefit of the doubt based on Lexus's reputation, and materials are top notch. It earns the very first 10 out of 10 I've ever given out in this category. Next up is practicality, where the LC500's trunk provides a mere 5.4 cubic feet of cargo space. That's small, and while the back seats could normally bump up the rating here, they're so small that it remains a 2 out of 10. Finally, value, and this is the hard one. Objectively, I think this car is worth every penny, but the Lexus badge makes it a hard sell for $100,000 against aspirational brands like Mercedes-Benz or Porsche. It gets a 6 out of 10 just because it's only a Lexus. 
Add it all up and the total daily score is 34, which places it near the top. And that's where it should be, is it's a luxurious, comfortable, high quality car whose score would go higher still if it were a little bit more practical. Total it all up and the Doug score is... 68, which places it surprisingly high on my chart. I think it deserves it. It's not a perfect sports car or a perfect luxury car, but it's good at both. And if you can't have a sports car and a daily driver and a luxury car and a high-tech fun car, the Lexus LC500 is a good compromise that combines it all.